My name is Ken Mintz. I'm on the Board of Education in San Ramon Valley Unified School District. And on behalf of the school district and the tri Valley chapter of Apampa, I welcome you all here this evening. You know, what is it that makes a great school district an environment for exceptional student learning? You know, to me, it, it's a number of different factors. It's involved parents, it's dedicated teachers and, and school staff, a supportive community and, and motivated students. And I know in our area here in the Valley, uh, we have all of those factors. Um, we have tremendous community partners that work with us on a number of different things. In fact, even in the, uh, the excuse me, James. <coughs> It always happens. Even in the facility that we're sitting in right now, uh, this Performing Arts Center uh, was a uh, synergy of the school district and the Board of Education uh, in the city of San Ramon working together uh, to bring this facility to us. Uh, this evening's presentation, you know, a, a collaboration between a Pampa and the school district uh, to bring this forum to you this evening. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our, our first guest. We have several speakers before the uh, state superintendent comes up to make some remarks. Um, I'd like to first start um, by introducing uh, Mayor Bill Clarkson. Uh, Bill is the mayor of San Ramon, uh, but he has very close ties to education as well. Bill served on the Board of Education of San Ramon Valley Unified uh, from 1998 until 2010. Um, he's very active in the community, uh, having achieved the San Ramon Chambers uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. And in uh, uh, 2011, uh, Bill became mayor and, and still holds that position. So with that, uh, if Mr. Clarkson will come up and make some big words for us. One of the first things I want to do is to thank Ken for his phone going off because I then turned my phone off <laughs> to save myself the embarrassment of going on. Um, one of the things I'd like to start off to do is to um, welcome um, State Superintendent of Schools Tom Torwickson and coming here to San Ramon. In fact, as, as we walked in, we walked in together, the first time I really had a chance to meet Tom, and, and he reminded me that uh, he was on the Board of Supervisors back in the 80s when San Ramon was first founded. So in many ways, we want to thank you for your efforts and, uh, and bringing this city together, an amazing city. In fact, I want to put a little bit of that in perspective in, in my brief remarks here. Um, one of the things that's interesting about San Ramon, and not because um, we know how a, what a successful city it is, but if you think about it, San Ramon is a majority minority city. Most folks wouldn't think of it that way. Only 62% of the residents is English, the first language that's being spoken in the household. 30% of our residents were born in another country. And 10% of the housing stock in San Ramon was built for low to moderate income. And so when you see a city that has those sorts of things going for it, um, it's interesting that when you turn around to the side, is that 99% of the students who come to our schools graduate from high school. 96% of them go on to a college. The other 3 or 4% go on usually to a trade school or to the military. There's record numbers of merit scholars. In fact, right here at Doherty Valley High School, there were 60 merit scholars who graduated last year. That's an amazing number, and I'm sure Tom, you would concur that this is a very successful high school. And right down the street is Windermere Ranch Middle School. Anybody here have children at Windermere Ranch? Nobody? A few? I see you hear a few voices. The number one middle school, number one ranked middle school in the entire state of California. It's amazing how well the city of San Ramon and their residents, and in particular their students, do. Because I think first and foremost, residents have made education their biggest priority. In fact, San Ramon has always talked itself about being a family-friendly city, and it's really succeeded in those ways. And they say you value where you put your money, and the San Ramon residents and our cities have put our money into our schools through bonds and and through parcel tax, and we've renovated and built lots of schools. Libraries, the busiest library in the entire county is right here in Doherty Valley. There are over 60 parks in San Ramon, with four more coming online in the next three years. 
Public safety is very, very important. We want our children to come back and forth from school safely every day. San Ramon is ranked as the safest city in the entire state for our size or larger. In fact, the fifth safest in the country. And we spend our assets protecting our children, protecting our residents, and we've created a great environment that way. It's been recognized as the number one city, family-friendly city in the state. It received an award as the best city to raise a child in the U.S. It got the distinction as being the wealthiest city in the country, but really what it meant is San Ramon has the highest concentration of professionals anywhere in the country. 63% of the households make $100,000 or more, and there's a reason why a lot of the high-tech jobs are now coming to San Ramon. Getting them off the freeways, by the way, because they can now get a job in San Ramon, because it's where they, this is where their, uh, those engineers and programmers live. And so it's with that sort of context I wanted to give Tom to give you an idea of how successful a district this is, and the reason it is because we have parents and families who really care about education, and that makes all the difference in the world. So thank you for this chance to share our brief moments, a few brief comments, and um, again, welcome State Superintendent of Schools Tom Torwicks into San Ramon. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. You know, a lot of Bill's remarks, you know, expand from the city of San Ramon to our entire district and even the Tri-Valley area. But we are very, very proud of our schools and the education system and, and the work that we've been able to do with our communities. Um, our next speaker uh, is Assemblymember Catherine Baker, uh, who also is no stranger to educational issues, both locally and at the state level. Uh, in her past, she's very, very, and currently as well, very, very active in her own children's schools and other local causes. Uh, in her law practice, uh, she's been recognized for her extensive pro bono efforts as well. She was elected in 2014 to represent the 16th Assembly District and currently is the Vice Chair of the Assembly Higher Education Committee and already a key sacramental voice on educational issues. Uh, please help me in welcoming uh, Assembly Member Catherine Baker. Thank you, Ken, and thank you to APAPA for APAPA Tri-Valley, which is a fairly newer chapter of APAPA in the Bay Area, but one that is thriving, and we're very proud to have you here, and we thank you for putting the resources and energy into putting together this forum for us. Um, it's difficult to do these at any time, but particularly during the holidays, a very busy season. So thank you to everyone with APAPA Tri-Valley and for bringing such a distinguished guest to visit with us today. I also would like to welcome Superintendent Torlickson. Um, I know this is a special place for you as, as uh, Contra Costa is your home county, and it's good to have you back, as I said, in the Sweet 16, uh, the 16th Assembly District, and very pleased and looking forward to your remarks. It's appropriate that we are um, taking some time away from the hustle and bustle of the holidays to discuss education policy and what's happening in education, given the importance that it has, not only for every child, uh, but also the, for the families in this area who dedicate so much of their time. This, this uh, opportunity for parents to come together shows the commitment that San Ramon and this valley has for their children. And it is one that we still face many challenges. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the superintendent's updates on some of these areas. They're challenges that do face the whole state. We certainly have challenges in our funding for our schools. We need to be sure that we are sending uh, funding that our schools need in order to provide an excellent education to every child regardless of zip code or neighborhood they grow up in. California continues to have challenges in that area and this last year this, our schools are going to receive some more funding after this last year's budget but going forward uh, we are well behind other states and it's important that we invest in our schools. Here locally we see families do that every day as we cart school supplies on the first day of school to fill the classroom I've done it in wagons myself, and I know many parents have, but also just in the tax support that we uh, provide in this community. So funding is, is an area in education that we still face many challenges, and I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle in the assembly, and also the superintendent, on what more we can be doing for funding in our schools. We do face the challenge with some policies that were set in place in prior years, uh, that cap the savings that we can have in our schools. We have a challenge for how we can reach a compromise so that that is not an impediment to financial stability in our school districts. And that's what I look forward to continuing to work on, including with our local school board members. And we also have some terrific resources in our schools. This school district is one of the examples of that, and that's our terrific teachers. 
dedicated professionals who are committing their, their lives and their energy to the future of our children, how we can support them with professional development that is not just early in the career and spotty, but is lifelong, on topic, and is helping them, including in the Common Core area, as we see some of the initial funding for Common Core professional development uh, potentially come to a close, and, uh, and looking forward to seeing how we can get more support for our teachers as we adapt to a new curriculum and standards, and how we can provide them with professional development that allows them to excel in other areas and all the resources they need. But in addition, there are needs for us to ensure that we are attracting great talent and principals. They are the managers at our schools, just like any organization or entities, it's important to have great managers and how we can do that well across the state is important. And we also have to make sure that we, we modernize our schools, not just our buildings, but how we operate. Um, with policies that ensure we have great, terrific, effective teachers and principals in our classrooms that allow parents to um, really work with them well. So these are some challenges. This is a valley that we, uh, we commit a lot of our resources and time as families to, to promoting those areas. And again, I, I make it a major part of my, my legislative work, not just as an assembly member, but also my work as a parent, as a parent of two young children, um, school-age children, they're 12, I do have twins, I'm very efficient, I had one of each, all at the same time. And they're seventh graders, they are, they are experiencing Common Core directly. Uh, and I have been in classrooms all throughout this assembly district, not just this school district and just elementary and middle school, but all across the grade spans, and see some of the challenges families are facing with Common Core and the new next generation science standards. And we need to work together on these for our kids. They get one shot in their education system and we've got to work together to make sure we're providing them with the most support we can. I don't think anyone in this room or anyone in any party, political party, would disagree with that. So um, it is terrific to have our superintendent here. One area we may not get to today but it does impact many families in this area is also higher education. Um, I'm vice chair of the higher education committee and I'm completely committed to ensuring that California's higher education system is affordable and accessible for Californians, and even a preference given to Californians, so that we, as hard as we are working to help them in their K through 12 education, are ensuring they have access uh, to our terrific higher education system in California. So there's a lot going on in education. The key is that we keep working together. It's no one component. It's not all on teachers. It's not all on principals and administrators, it's not all on parents. We are working together. And it's definitely something we must do in a bipartisan way. So I'm thrilled to have our superintendent of public education here and welcome you and look forward to a terrific forum with you. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine, for those remarks. Uh, next, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the superintendent of San Ramon Valley Unified School District, Mary Shelton. Uh, Mary became a uh, superintendent in 2012. Uh, she is a lifelong learner and educator. Uh, Mary has been a classroom teacher. Uh, she's been an administrator in both public and private schools. Um, and, and she brings a, a love of learning and a mantra shared across our district that all of our children are all of our children, ensuring that each and every student gets the best possible education that we can provide. Mary. Thank you, Ken. Welcome, and it is my pleasure to be here tonight. I thank you for the invitation, and I thank you for the partnership with APAPA to welcome our state superintendent, Torlickson, to our district. As has been said, we are a community that values and focuses on education. We have 32,000 students and about 3,400 employees, so we're a large district. But we're also one of the highest achieving districts in California, as Mayor Clarkson mentioned. In the past year, CASP testing showed 82% of our students achieving the standards or exceeding the Common Core English Language Arts Standards. On our first try, on our first test, we think we did well, but there's always room for improvement. Why? Because a combination of great teachers, great parents, and great community support. 
When I arrived in 2012, one of my first challenges was to implement Common Core standards across our districts. Our teachers embraced Common Core from the beginning because they felt it was good for kids. They enjoyed teaching at a deeper level, at the conceptual level. They're, they work every day to improve their craft. I'd like to talk a little bit about our partnerships. We have a $313 million annual budget. We receive 17 million of that in donations from both private and parents in the community. Another 6.7 comes from our recently renewed parcel tax. Those funds have allowed us, even in the darkest of economic times, to maintain art and music classes at every grade level, to maintain science specialists at every elementary, and to support all of those extras that we believe help our students to thrive. In San Ramon Valley, all our kids are all our kids, and we are interested in educating the whole child. We continue to expand and refurbish our schools because our community in 2012 passed a $260 million facilities bond. We have the largest PTA membership in Northern California, over 20,000 members. Now, when you consider that we have 32,000 students, that's more than every parent. Over 16,000 of our parents are registered in our online volunteer management system. They donate 300,000 hours yearly to our schools. So it's not just their resources, but their time, their care, that makes our school district so great. We have countless joint use projects with both the city of San Ramon and the town of Danville, allowing each of us to enjoy beautiful and well-maintained facilities that would be difficult for each of us without the other. These partnerships benefit our kids, a three-legged stool supporting our children, district, parents, community, that have helped to make our district so great. I want to thank everyone here for the support for our schools and your interest in education and welcome Superintendent Torlakson to San Ramon Valley Unified. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, next, I'd like to invite up Andy Lee. Andy is the president of the newly formed Tri-Valley Chapter of Pampa. Uh, he's a local, I'd say he's something of an activist. He's, he's brought folks together in a very, very positive way. And it really was the, uh, uh, the force behind uh, bringing uh, Superintendent Tarlickson here this evening to meet with us. He's also an active member at the Darty Valley San Ramon Rotary Club. And um, with that, uh, Andy, why don't you come up and see if you uh, Thank you, Ken. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for attending this event, uh, especially under such a rainy weather condition. But the good thing is, uh, about weather is rainy green and uh, it will relieve our uh, drought condition. Uh, today, I have the honor to introduce uh, some elected officials and VIPs. Uh, first, uh, I think is our uh, speaker, uh, <coughs> Superintendent Tom Clarkson here, and uh, also the Assemblywoman uh, Catherine Baker, and uh, I think the ceremony mayor uh, Bill Clarkson just left and uh, Ceremon City Council, Phil Oron here, and uh, also our uh, Greg in home is Congo Costa County, Congo Costa Community College District Board, and uh, of course also the Cheryl Cook uh, Camille, the former Pleasant uh, City Council, yes, over there. And also, I'd like to introduce uh, some uh, PAPA officials who attended this event. And uh, uh, I think I have the uh, Barry Region Joe Wang here, the Barry Region uh, President. And uh, we have is the Barry Chair uh, Albert Wang here. I cannot see it behind. Uh, oh, she's at the back. Yes. And uh, also, the Executive Director, Vicky Chen. Thank you, Vicky. And uh, we have our Vice President Min Tao here. Okay, thank you, Min. And uh, also we have uh, Vice President and Treasurer uh, Nancy Chen. And uh, 
we have some board member, director, and advisors uh, like uh, Monica Sai. Thank you. And uh, Tiffany, are you here? Oh, okay. Thank you, Tiffany. And uh, we have her, uh, Fred Koji, our advisor. And uh, I think so that's pretty much our VIP today. And uh, let's give them a round of applause to welcome them. Thank you. So next, I'd like to uh, let our uh, Bear Region President, uh, Joe Wong, to talk about the PAPA, uh, also um, introduce the State Superintendent, Tom Clarkson. Thank you for coming for such a, on such a rainy night. Uh, it gives us great pleasure for Papa to be co-sponsoring this event. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about Papa. I don't think everybody knows what we do. We are a non-profit, not-for-profit organization, basically for moving Asian American into the mainstream. Let me explain a little bit. Asian American has been here a long time. As a matter of fact, we just celebrated 150 years of uh, uh, anniversary of the railroad workers who have contributed tremendously to the United States. It's not until 1964 that the floodgate for immigration from other parts of the world other than Northern European. Since then, the Asian population in this country has grown to almost 6%. And also, our accomplishment is in this country, especially in education and also in the high-tech industry, has been tremendous. Yet, uh, we are not quite mainstream yet. So, so PAPA is a non-profit organization that, whose purpose is to do four things. Mainly, get Asian American involved. Get them to register to vote, get them to vote. Uh, we have internship program that help our children to learn leadership skill and so on. I know they are doing real well in schools, but they're not doing so hot in the other areas. So we have internship program to do that. And also, we encourage our parents to get involved with the community since we are Asians are, our culture is to promote education. We want our parents to get involved with the PTA and maybe in school board and so on, and we want to promote Asian American to be part of the legislature and so on. So this is the purpose of a papa, and it would give us tremendous pleasure to be uh, part of this program. Now I'd like to introduce Tom Tollickson, a long time friend of the house. He was a friend when we were Kappa, and he's a friend we are now a papa because a papa took over most of the Kappa duties in this area. Tom is a graduate. Uh, before Tom was a graduate from UC Berkeley, he joined the Merchant Marine during the Vietnam War and after the war, he graduated from UC Berkeley with lifetime preaching, life teaching credential and master's degree in education. And Tom is now the superintendent of the public education in California, overseeing a diverse and dynamic system of 10,000 public schools uh, covering 6.3 million students. Tom started a career as a teacher. He was involved in the school district, then the, the uh, county supervisor, and he served three terms, two terms initially as in the state assembly, then he served two terms in the state senate, if I'm correct, and then he um, also served the third term at the state assembly. He was elected last term to be the superintendent of California, and this is the second term of 
his uh, service as the superintendent of California. Tom is an athlete. He coaches cross country and uh, he is a lifetime educator. And I also mentioned that May Tollickson is basically following his staff running for assemb state assembly and in the coming election when uh, Susan Bonier is termed out. So we wish both of them good luck. Tom, it gave me tremendous pleasure to introduce you and uh, we're very proud that you are here to talk to us about the school system. Good evening, everyone. It's a good evening, right? It's raining. And Joel, thank you for your leadership, for that very generous introduction. And if we could have the lights come back on just so I can see out to who you are. I appreciate that you came here. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. Uh, Andy Lee and Joel Wong said, you know, there's lots of energy. They, the two of them have energy. They, they have lots of positive energy. But they said, you got to get ready for this group that's going to come out because if they can make it through the weather and the traffic and get here, they're very special. So you are, and I thank you. And I did, I did run at a little break in the rain, just a drizzle, a uh, half hour to get my endorphins kicked in. I've had four cups of coffee, so the caffeine's kicked in so I could keep up with your energy. And so I'm very delighted to, to be here and share a perspective and then to answer questions. And, and I appreciate uh, uh, the range of topics you will have to bring forward with your questions and suggestions. And I do also care deeply about higher education. Uh, the Assemblywoman mentioned that as a key area. I am a region in the UC system and a trustee in the CSU system. So I, I see the need to articulate better, to coordinate better. Uh, so much work needs to be done to provide more capacity to higher education. So I'm sure you'll have some questions about that as we move forward in the, in the evening forum. I want to also thank Bill and Ken uh, for your involvement in this, the mayor gave a wonderful presentation of the tremendous attributes here of this great school district and this great city. Um, I had many memories coming back down here as I had a recent chance to visit Cal High and then to get here to Doherty Valley High School. I was involved in the creation of this area when I was on the Board of Supervisors in terms of the planning for this extension of San Ramon Valley uh, and I was also involved when Bishop Ranch was not there, and, but it was proposed to be a housing track, all housing. And I said, no, we needed a job center, so I helped lead to get uh, Chevron and Pac Bell out to this area and create the job space, which has been so important to the success of this region. I also want to thank Catherine, uh, again, Catherine Baker, uh, for her uh, leadership and keen interest in education. And also to thank the, the school, again, Ken and Mary, uh, our superintendent, Thank you, I had a great tour of Cal High. I was impressed with many things, including their emphasis on the arts. Do we need more you know, music, dance, drama in our schools, more of the arts back in our schools? Yes? yes. I think we do, and some, some will talk about STEAM, uh, but there's also uh, the idea of bringing the arts into our science education, uh, along with STEM education. So, uh, again, a stellar, outstanding district, and I want to thank the young people who are here, uh, I don't know if it's a school night or not, some, some schools are already on vacation, but let's have all the young people uh, stand up, in, and young at heart, stand up. <laughs> uh, just stand up and let's thank them for being here and being engaged, being interested. Thank you. And I think it's always important to do this uh, as, a, as a teacher, but one who works with teachers every day. Uh, if you're a teacher in the past or currently, uh, please uh, stand up and be recognized, and then I want all the administrators and principals and superintendents to stand up. Thank you for your service, your valuable service. You are the key to making a difference, and we know education is the key to a better society, a better economy, and a, and a better world, and better personal attainment of goals and, and potential. And it, the PAPA has just been a great organization. I'm so glad it's flourishing. and. and anchoring in here solid in San Ramon Valley. Again, thanks to Andy Lee and Joel for your leadership. And they do an incredibly important job of empowering young people to see their own potential, but then also to see how they can work together in teams and they can work together to make a difference and become leaders themselves in our community. Uh, 
uh, in, you know, the state of California recognizes May as the uh, Asian Pacific Islander American Month, and there are 5.8 million uh, API residents in California, the largest of any state in the United States. And that's something to be proud of. Hardworking and high value on education. So it's wonderful to have the school district and Apapa working together. A friend of mine, Bob Vincent, uh, was a coach at Santa Monica High, and always uh, you know, somebody I looked up to. I was coaching the other, other teams in other parts of Contra Costa County. But he emphasized the team theme, and I adapted it uh, to my students. Usually had 50, 60 students on my cross-country running teams, and we did about 12 championships over 20 years of coaching. But it wasn't about winning or losing, it's about setting goals, it's about uh, feeling good, it's about improving where you are to a, to a better place where you want to go. And so I just wanted to do a shout out to Bob Vincent, he was a great uh, track cross country coach and uh, swimming coach at San Juan Valley High School. And I remembered him on the way down. So, by the way, what does, how do you spell team and what does it stand for? Spell it out, T-E-A-M. What's it? Okay, what's that stand for? Together. Together. Everyone. Everyone. Accomplishes. Accomplishes. More. More. All right, team. All right, you ready for the team thing? And that's, that's why education is moving forward in California because we have good teamwork. We've been fostering that collaboration and consensus. We, we are moving forward together. You know, I, I visit classrooms all around the state. A, a, a few weeks ago, I went on a tour of the North State, very different topography, very different climate, uh, very different uh, terrain. Uh, 2,000 miles we drove in six days, went to six counties, uh, you know, from Humboldt and Mendocino over to Del Norte and Lassen and down around to Tehama and Trinity County. And in, in Trinity County, they have very small districts, some of them uh, only 100 or 200 students. Uh, in Trinity County, I visited Junction City Elementary School District uh, with 87 students. And then, of course, here, 32,000 in San Ramon. And a few weeks uh, after, I also went to Los Angeles, 642,000. And so, great diversity in this wonderful state of California. Uh, but not divided in, in that sense, uh, actually unified in purpose. So when I visited classrooms, I saw students doing amazing things. I saw teachers teaching their heart out. And they shared in common with the teachers here in San Juan Valley and in Los Angeles and San Bernardino and across California, a common passion for having students believe in themselves, and gain self-confidence, and dream big, aim high, dream big, and you'll go far. And so that was a, an eye-opening but important trip to get to that rural part of California. Uh, we have a mission uh, in the Department of Education, if we could have the mission statement up there. And surprise, here's Brianna Mullen on my staff, who knows how to work the computer faster than I can. So uh, I just wanted to go through this just so you see what we're aiming at in terms of our overall goals. California will provide a world-class education for all students from early childhood to adulthood. The Department of Education serves our state by innovating and collaborating with educators, schools, parents, and community partners. Together as a team, we prepare students to live, work, and thrive in a multicultural, multilingual, and highly connected world. So I wanted to share that because what we've done in the last decade is really forge our own way in the last four years um, we sort of stood up and said, we want to do it the California way. So how are we having success in meeting this goal, uh, this set of goals? Uh, it is through, again, a lot of hard work and good vision, but we, we first started with standards, new standards, uh, known as Common Core, although I've dropped that out of the vocabulary because we now want to include, under new California state standards, new rigorous standards, we want to include math, English language arts, and we want to bring in and talk about science. So, so important to the economy of California and to the improvement of the world. And getting our students STEM educated well uh, is really, really important. Uh, so we have these new standards and we also have English de language development standards integrated in how do we help English learners more quickly become proficient? How do we help them convert, uh, read class uh, into proficient English speakers and English writers. And so we, we have these new standards and soon we're gonna have social sciences and civics and history standards coming. So what this means is 
it, it's not top down from Washington D.C. Although Washington D.C. tried to do things and force us to do things we didn't want to do over the past few years, uh, but it, the the idea that the higher standards recognizes that school chiefs in the 50 states, uh, school officials in the 50 states said we're falling behind the rest of the world. We're not competitive. We're, we're falling behind in our academic achievement for our students to be prepared for a fierce global economy. And so new standards came from school chiefs like myself and from governors. It's not top down, it's not Fed Ed, it's not Obama Ed. It really emerged from a desire to be more rigorous and have our education be more relevant and to have our students better prepared for the global economy, for careers right after school, uh, or while in school, and uh, certainly for college. Uh, so this is really important, and we've, we've um, resisted the, the idea that you need to just test, test, and drill the test, and drill the test some more, uh, and you test and punish and test and judge. This is more about assessments and testing, is more about empowering uh, teachers and students with data, with, with trends, with idea, with an analysis of how well students are doing. And I've found around the state of California that teachers are embracing this new approach to learning and teaching. Uh, it's more about teamwork and good communication skills, writing skills, verbal skills, and critical thinking, problem solving. It's about taking evidence to back up your argument. It's back up, prove your hypothesis, get the data together, and, and move in that direction. And so we did approach it on a bipartisan basis in California. Uh, we did approach it, uh, you know, working together to get the funds, to get it started. A lot more funding is needed uh, to implement it, but it's a, it's a new day and it's exciting. Uh, I find teachers and students alike around the state are very interested and they find their classwork, both from the teacher and the student, uh, to be, you know, more creative and demanding more innovation on their part and deeper thinking all around. Now we, we have a new assessment system. Uh, do you remember the old STAR system, the old CSTs? Multiple choice, fill in the bubbles. That's history. Uh, the State Department of Ed U.S. Department of Education tried to get California to do the old testing while we were preparing to do the new testing. And we said no. The California legislature said no. Uh, I said no. The governor said no. We're not going to do double testing. We took the money saved by uh, sort of defined in the U.S. Department of Education. We did not go forward with the old testing. We took that money and we rolled it into giving a trial test to about uh, 2 million students and did the full test this year to 3.2 million students. And we provided uh, more computer capacity in the schools, not near enough yet, but we're getting there. Uh, we provided professional development for teachers who are thirsty for uh, ways to go about teaching this new approach. And we also had some money for curriculum, for the new uh, curriculum to go along with the new standards. And so we did administer the test this year, and, and, and San Ramon is off the charts, uh, double the state average in proficiency and in reaching the, the, the targets and the standards. Uh, so congratulations to all of you as part of the San Ramon Valley team. Just think though, 3.2 million students, we made a big push and we got more connected to the internet. How many students had to take the old paper and pencil style test uh, because they had no access to the internet? And I'm talking about go down to Death Valley, go up to Del Norte County, go over to Modoc. Uh, think how big the state is. How many students were not able to connect to the internet to take the test? Only 900. So within a few short years, really a big push in the last three years. Uh, I had an initiative called No Child Left Offline, and, which was the idea that let's, let's get our kids connected to the internet to rich learning opportunities where they can also collaborate with the Google Docs, they can be working on a report together, they can be working on it at home, uh, they can be working on Saturday, they can be working together in the classroom. And so the, the, it's a game changer to me, the use of technology in schools used well and using assessment data as a way to guide where do I need to improve my lessons in this class to get this concept across? How do I help these students? So the computer adaptive part of this, as you take the test, if you're answering every question correctly, it'll give you harder and harder questions. And so like if you're taking third grade math and you're already advanced, maybe your fifth grade math, the computer will guide you and will let the teacher know and you know that you're, you're more proficient, you're up at a higher level. Now, if you're answering all the questions wrong, you're, you're not getting it, 
you may end up being judged to be or assessed to be at uh, first grade level. But then with that data, the teacher knows how each of the students um, works and, and what they need to learn and individualizes instruction to help. Uh, that's the goal, ultimately, of, of the assessments. A couple of other things I wanted to mention relate to career education. Now, one last footnote on the assessments, by the way. Uh, in other states, there have been lots of controversy over the new standards. The, the Common Core has got a bad name in other states. But again, working with the business community here, we, and I want to talk about these partnerships with the business community, uh, we avoided that. California had only 1% opt-out of parents saying, I don't want my students to take these tests. Uh, Washington State had 53% opt-out. New York had 20% opt-out. So in other states, it's become a political football, the new standards uh, between the legislature, the governor, and the education community. But in California, we stuck together. I call it again the California way. We, we, we wanted to do it our way. We didn't want to follow top-down orders from Washington, but we wanted to make sure the education was streamlined in a way and adaptive in a way that helps our, our schools. And so uh, one way we're doing this and also engaging exciting students uh, is through partnerships with business and other employers. They could be public employers too, like the City of San Ramon Public Works Department or the City of San Ramon Police Department. Uh, and what we're finding is that students who are engaged in career pathways get a sense of where they want to go. They start setting goals. They get excited about learning. It's learning with a purpose. It's learning connected to the real world. It's learning to help them get to a place where they can get that dream job. And so I'll just give you an example. I was up in Del Norte County. Uh, the students there had 3D printers. They had uh, AutoCAD. They were doing advanced drafting. They, they drafted. They conceived of a house. They drafted it on AutoCAD. They did all the construction plans. Uh, what they did is go in the morning. They went to their math class and their science class and their civic social studies class. In the afternoon, they went to the job site where they had started the construction of the home and from scratch. They laid all the utilities, the electrical, the water, the sewer, the digital, and they went about building a house over the course of a year, including, you could see them doing the design of the kitchen and move a wall here and put cabinets over there. They, they had these great skills, and many of them were actually already working in the private sector, hired by companies who already appreciate uh, the skills they have. And by the way, when the, when, the, when the class is done and the school year is done, they sell the house and they have proceeds. And the next year's group of students takes the money, buys another lot of land, builds another house. What do you think of that? Hands-on learning, relevant learning. And these kids are excited about school. Now, we've recently achieved a goal, a high standard of 81% graduation rate in the state of California. Now, that, no. In, in fact, when you average, that means that some groups are lower. Latino students and African American students are still down in the 70% uh, achievement of graduation. But the students involved in the career education programs, it's more like 95 to 98% graduation rate. So from whatever ethnicity, whatever economic background, uh, students are finding uh, excitement in learning and, and staying in school and, and not ditching school. So I think that's a, a key issue to think about. The legislature, I worked for 10 years to get money to bring back vocational education or career education, as we call it. And the legislature, thank you, uh, Kath, and thank you, uh, others who've helped with this. We, we now have had $500 million given to my department to create these incredible partnerships. So we're seeing uh, students across the state involved in medical sciences, computer sciences, Wherever the regional economy is, high school students are connected to college, community college, and connected to employers. And we have already over 5,000 employers in California offering mentorships and internships, so students get a real taste of the work world that they're going to be entering into. So I, I think that's really important. Uh, I'll end with saying uh, we need resources. Uh, you mentioned the local bond measure. Thank you, Mary Shelton. And, superintendent and the team here that passed the, the school bond. But we need the state of California to step up and pass a bond measure. It hasn't been done since 2006. I was the author of three of the measures that went to the voters and were successfully passed. 
We have $9 billion that will be on the ballot in November 2016. I urge you to go out and support those measures. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, schools need more. We're seeing a renaissance due to Prop 30 and due to the recovering economy of California. So those billions of dollars extra that are flowing into the schools have created an opportunity to have civics and science taught again, the arts flourish, uh, to have more equipment, more science equipment, lab equipment, uh, career technical education equipment. So I say we must invest. I urge you to be there. We're going to have a debate in California. Should we continue any part of Prop 30 to keep money flowing? I personally think we should, but that's a good healthy debate we, we should have about how to get the extra funding. And so I'll um, just end, we're, we're dream makers, uh, you're dream makers, uh, especially those of you in education, but those of you involved in business, you're also following dreams and building uh, dreams of a brighter future. And so um, I, I think that's key to connect our work to the real world. Up in uh, Del Norte County again, in Crescent City, I visited a school and first, first and second graders put this, uh, this book together. So they have wonderful illustrations. We're going to show you four slides as we wrap up and get ready for questions. So there we are. There, the title of, you know, what does a kid want to be? So they wrote a story about what they want to be. And so I'm going to give Brianna that and get to the stories. You can go to the next slide. Amelia. She wants to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor because I love doctors. They are so kind to us. They give us the shots to make us healthy. I would wear a white jacket and listen to the heartbeat. I will be a good doctor. Jordan. Now many of the students want to be teachers, veterinarians, dentists. You could name the career. One, one young girl wanted to be a princess. That was her occupational destination. <laughs> Then you had Jordan, who wanted to be a, a cop. When I grow up, I want to be a cop. When someone is being bad, I might arrest him and take him to jail. When people hurt you, I will taser them. <laughs> I will wear really cool cop clothes and drive a cop car. <laughs> now, Crescent City is the home of a state prison, and so the, a lot of the students grow up with their parents and you know, their relatives involved in, in law enforcement in that area, okay? Um, Nevehu, I want to help kids to be with their parents and to be happy. I will work for CPS, Child Protective Services. I will help kids' parents to be healthy. I will make sure kids can visit their moms. And that's her, her view of the world. So there's some pain and some issues going on in that, that young lady's life. The last one I'll read, and they're all delightful. Um, if you ever will, we're posting on online so if you ever want to read more of them. But Andrew wants to be the ice cream man. <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be an ice cream man. I will sell people free chocolate ice cream. If they want vanilla, they have to give me $10. <laughs> if they don't have money, it's free. <laughs> so that person, that young boy, is either going to be a great entrepreneur or the head of a you know, nonprofit organization. <laughs> But you have the hopes of a girl for her family, you have the hopes of another girl for uh, going into the STEM education, STEM pathway towards being a doctor. And so I, I conclude this part of, of my presentation just to say, I think we're all about helping kids achieve their dreams, and uh, there's a lot of complicated issues to sort through, uh, but at the heart of it all is, is this common purpose we have as educators, as parents, as community leaders, to make sure we have thriving schools and thriving students in those schools. So thank you very much for being here tonight, and I look forward to your questions. And I don't know how you want to do that in terms of Ken moderating the, the question and answer part, but uh, thank you for being here, everybody. Yeah, I'm over your shoulder. Superintendent Torres, thank you very much for your comments. You know, I really appreciate you sharing the uh, the student yeah, work. Yeah. I, I'll just say quickly, I recall this past year I was able to read to a class during Read Across yeah. America. 
And the teacher from that class sent me uh, some of the children's work thanking me for being in the classroom. So some pictures and some words. And one little girl sent me a picture and it was stick figures. And it was me sitting in a chair and all the children sitting on the ground, a little, little word bubble over my head for my words. And in the bubble it said, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Kids say the darndest things. <laughs> I felt more like a politician, I'll tell you. Well, we did collect some, some, uh, okay. some questions beforehand, and there were some cards, so if anyone has some additional questions, please uh, make sure that they get collected, and we'll ask those as well. But to get started here, I thought I might be interested, if you can give us a sense, you know, we, we all don't have much of a chance to see what's happening at the state level. If you can just give us a little bit about what is your role compared to that of the State Board of Education? Well, we work together. Uh, the State Board of Educa Education is appointed by the governor and develops various policies. I am an implementing arm. Uh, I oversee our budget, which is about $78 billion federal and state money together for schools. I have uh, 2,500 employees. I run two schools for the deaf and one school for the blind. I take over school districts that are in trouble. So uh, Inglewood School District was spending $15 million more than it was taking in. It was going bankrupt. So the legislature said, Tom Torlickson, you're now in charge of this district. So I took over 19 schools and 11,000 students and I'm turning it. We ended up with a balanced budget after two and a half years. Uh, so we made some tough decisions. So I have those implementing arms running the schools and running schools that are given to me by the legislature to fix. And then uh, we help implement, we have helped implement everything from the STEM programs, the new policies on the Common Core, the new standards. Uh, so we, we have an implementing arm. I have uh, 1,500 of those employees uh, that are working to implement policy, working from you know, special schools around the state. Uh, we also deliver four and a half, well, we help prepare four and a half million meals a day in the state of California that we deliver to students across the state. So that's a, a snapshot and that we, at the State Board of Education, uh, my staff gives the reports and does the research to make choices available to the State Board to advance our policy. Very good, thank you. So um, many in the school community are concerned about the reserve caps that are placed on local school budgets on last year's budget. Um, and before that goes into effect, we're wondering uh, what your stand might be on those reserve caps and how we might be able to better deal with that situation. Well, they shouldn't be there. If local control funding formula, to me, the whole thrust behind it was we will trust our local officials, our local school board, and our local superintendents to you know, have a sense of where they need to be in terms of what level of reserves to have. So I've been opposed to that policy from the very beginning when it first showed up in a budget and I think it's time to you know, end that policy and uh, either modify it greatly or just uh, put it to sunset. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, the other thing that's happened recently is at the state level we eliminated the high school exit exam. I'm just wondering what you see in terms of some type of replacement for that, or how do you see that one progressing? You know, we're testing uh, third through eighth grade, doing these assessments that I was talking about, and once in high school, usually that's the 11th grade. Uh, I think that's a lot of testing already. Uh, the reason we put the uh, exit exam to rest uh, is because it wasn't relevant really anymore. It wasn't aligned to the new state standards, and the bar was very low. And so we will use diagnostically the information over the next year, year and a half, while we look at a replacement for the exit exam. It's not just over forever, we're looking at, oh, how do we define uh, what a high school diploma means? What, what levels of proficiency should you have in each of the subject areas? And so figuring that out, I have a task force that's forming that will be working for about a year and a half. We're due to report back to the legislature on that, but it's a very important uh, topic to have a sense for business leaders, well, what kind of skills do you have? What does that high school diploma mean? And the same for parents, uh, same for the students to have that understanding. What we are moving towards, by the way, though, and these career courses are, are ideal for this, is cer certificates of competency. And in, in high school, again, one of the very interesting trends that I'm pushing and promoting is to have dual enrollment. So we're seeing students they get proficient, they, they get certificates in, in 
high school, whether it's auto shop, medical sciences, medical professional fields, construction, they get competency certificates that are portable. And then while they're in high school, they're earning credit for community college work. So what we're seeing is many students, uh, Godotti High School is located on the Sierra College campus up in uh, Nevada County. I, I met with medical science students who are right in the community college campus. They graduate from high school with an AA at the same time. And one, girl, one young lady uh, graduated with an AA in chemistry and in physician assistant. She had two AAs by the time she finished high school. And what does that do? It, it's so important. It, 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 it allows that person to graduate and then within two to three years, they have their BS uh, degree. They're ready to go work, be part of the economy, uh, flourishing. They don't have the same debt load. Uh, so this trend of dual enrollment, I just came back from Sanger and Clovis High Schools down in Fresno for a trip late last week. And it's just thriving and the legislature raised the cap so more dual enrollment opportunities are gonna be provided. So I think these are other ways where we can define what a high school diploma means. Some students will go ahead right on track to getting 30, 40, 50 units towards their ultimate degree. They're, they're attending community college campuses and at Sanger High School, they actually had college professors from the community college coming on campus to the high school campuses to teach uh, the, the program. They had ag mechanics, uh, plant science, and a few other things where they, they invited in the professors right there on the school grounds, high school grounds. Yeah, and that person, I really appreciate that uh, once the decision was made to uh, eliminate the X exam, you know, we dealt quickly through the legislature on those kids that were caught in the middle, because there were some who, for whatever reason, weren't able to take and pass the X exam in that year, last year. And I know we had a couple here locally that I was really pleased to see that we were able to turn around and give them the keys. So thank you for your advice at the state level. Um, you know, moving to the federal level, no, now that uh, No Child Left Behind is being replaced by the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, uh, President Obama signed that on December 10th, just a week and a half ago. Uh, how do you see that playing out in California now? Well, first we're glad to see No Child Left Behind left behind. <laughs> And they left the money behind, unfortunately, when they implemented all these standards and, you know, orders from Washington, they, they sort of forgot to give us the money. So, uh, there's some increase in funding in STEM and early education. I'm getting, it's a big bill, a lot of details. My staff's breaking it down. I'm going to get a full briefing on it uh, later this week. Uh, but the good news is, it's more like the California way. It, we talked about states' rights. I, I met with the president directly uh, about three months ago. Um, you know, he was hopeful. He wanted to emphasize some more on early learning. He was uh, hopeful on STEM. Uh, at that point, Congress would, had been gridlocked for six and a half years. And now, after seven years of gridlock, they finally came through and, much on a bipartisan basis, uh, adopted the new ESSA. Uh, and I'm, uh, I think, again, it reflects our values Generally speaking, uh, it has the California way with local control, states' rights. Uh, let us decide. You know, New Maryland and Florida and Texas and California, are, you know, are different than Washington, Oregon, and Utah. So I had a couple of questions here about uh, teacher evaluations. One question came up from the audience, a couple of folks, about should parents be involved in teacher evaluations, and then more broadly, how do you see the evaluation process moving forward? Well, yes, the evaluation process was very simple. Uh, yes, parents should be involved and, and, and often are. It depends on the school district. Uh, again, under the idea of local control, we're leaving it up to local school districts to define what are the ingredients of success? What are, how do we measure uh, accountability? And, and so I think that's uh, an issue. Instead of just test scores or trying to say this teacher is really good because this teacher has students who have really good test scores. But what about a teacher who's really good at helping kids on the edge with emotional problems, with trauma in their life? They got behind or they, they spoke a different language for the first 10 years of their life and now they're behind. Uh, so, you know, those, the use of test scores to evaluate teachers as a sole method of evaluating an effective teacher, it's wrong at least half the time. Statistically, uh, good teachers are labeled bad teachers and bad teachers are labeled good teachers. But the multiple uh, faceted, multifaceted approach that we're now looking at is uh, school boards have a menu of choices it, and you may want to judge the school's success and the teacher's success in a variety of ways. Uh, it may be uh, how well the school 
uh, prepares students for college. It may be how well a school prepares, including AP courses, including A to G completion rates, high, high rates. It, it may be some other factors. What do you do for the arts? What do you do for career education? So our definition of what a successful school is, and then also how we evaluate teacher, uh, teachers, is, is underway. And parents uh, should certainly be involved. Students are involved in some districts, so it, it really is a local issue. And uh, parents usually are very involved, active parents, like I know this community has such very active parents. Uh, they are very involved in their, their students' education. They talk to the teacher. They, they call the teacher up and they're, or now email the teacher and have, you know, up-to-date information about their son and daughter's uh, work in school. So it's, I think, many voices and many angles that are important. Thank you. So um, one of the challenges we're seeing is, and it gets to, you know, preparing kids uh, for our own profession in teaching. And we're seeing, starting to see a real shortage in teachers, particularly in particular areas. I know in our district, a number of districts around here, we're seeing a real shortage in substitutes, for instance. Uh, but in the teaching profession, uh, what do you see as some ways of encouraging uh, young people to consider teaching as a profession? Well, you're absolutely right. There's, it's like an iceberg. We're seeing the tip of the iceberg, but the bulk of the problem is coming, and it's, uh, it's, it's very, very serious in terms of a general teacher shortage. About six years ago, the number of candidates who were in teacher preparation programs for a K-12 teaching credential were about 70,000. Today it's 20,000. So a number of things has happened. And I think de deplorably there was a lot of bashing and blaming of teachers. And during the recession sometimes that, that, that happens. There was layoffs and there was you know, confusion and uh, a lot of disruption and, and the education community got blamed. Uh, and teachers were bashed publicly. And I, th I, deplore, I think that's deplorable. Uh, so what we have to do is turn it around, number one, it's such a rewarding profession, it's such a great opportunity to turn someone's life around, to turn young people in a positive direction, give them self-confidence and skills. Uh, and so what we're looking at doing, and we're going to philanthropy, and if any of you have checkbooks that want to contribute to this, we're going to do a statewide campaign about the greatness and the wonderful joys of being a teacher. And, and we need to change that mindset and, and underscore the value of that. Um, we, we also need to provide ways to articulate better. There are career changers who come from the private sector who want to now, after maybe 15 years, 20 years in a profession, whether they're an engineer, an architect, a uh, bioscientist, they want to come and teach. And we, we need to clear the hurdles to make it easier for them to transfer into education. We're also looking at uh, low interest and forgivable loans. So uh, we have a harder time attracting teachers for high poverty areas. We have a harder time attracting teachers in STEM, science and math, um, and in career technical education. Those teachers with you know, the skills to build things, to uh, know how to take apart a computer and put it back together. Uh, so we're, we're looking at ways to make it easier to get into the profession and support. One last footnote on that, I visited two schools uh, recently where the students are cadets from their sophomore year on, they go, it's a three year course of study, uh, they're teaching cadet, cadets, they learn everything about teaching and they go through a whole course sequence so that they're ready to teach. Uh, they go, actually while they're still in high school, junior, senior year, they go you know, mentor kids, teach kids in middle school and elementary schools and they're excited about education and, and <coughs> by and large they go on to the career of teaching and they come back to their community, so there's a double benefit because they come back with the diversity. They know their community, they know their neighborhoods, they know some of the families, and they come back and give back to their community. I appreciate your answer there. You know, one of the things you mentioned was particularly trying to attract teachers in low poverty or high poverty areas. And, um, you know, given the uh, Vergara lawsuit uh, that kind of stemmed from that environment, uh, there was a question about where you stand on the issue of um, challenging the teacher tenure system and seniority rights and those type of issues. Yeah. Well, I, against the Vigero lawsuit, I think it was the wrong approach to try to, you know, solve issues that are, that are challenging and complex. Um, you know, what the tenure system does is afford rights for teachers to have fair hearings if they're accused of something. If their performance isn't up to par, they have a chance to bring forward uh, their case and have it heard. And before tenure, that wasn't always the case. 
and many teachers were coerced out of the profession without a fair hearing. Uh, and then as far as seniority, I'll say this, in most professions, do you want a doctor who's done a hernia operation uh, uh, 300 times or a heart operation 200 times or someone who's just fresh at it? Generally speaking, in most professions, the practitioner becomes better as time goes on, and that is the case in the teaching profession. One of the things that's been missing is support, because a lot of teachers, uh, say some teachers are not adept at technology, and it's this change uh, to beta, you know, using computers so much may be foreign to them, then they need some support in professional development. So there's two places where we lose a lot of teachers. The new teachers coming in, uh, about 18, 19% leave the profession within four years. So we've invested all this time and energy, but if they are mentored, by a skilled teacher through that early stage, the first two years of their being in the classroom, their retention rate is much, much higher. And they become great teachers and they stay great teachers. Uh, teachers who are struggling with their practice or maybe they got addicted to alcohol, maybe they, something else happened in their life and they got off track. Then there are support programs. One of those is called PAR, Peer Assistance Review. And if a chemistry teacher is off course and that teacher's students are far behind students in similar classes in the same school, uh, the principal assigns teachers, volunteers, who will be teacher leaders and mentor that person with specific deadlines of you have to improve here, here, and here by these dates. And if you do, you get to stay. If you don't, you should consider leaving the profession. And by and large, those that don't make it, meeting those benchmarks, understand that they're not fit for the profession and need to move out. And so those are more preferred methods than the litigation. Really trying to help people develop to their maximum skill potential. Build that capacity. Um, with the recent school lockdown of Los Angeles schools, what do you see as having to be done to ensure the safety of our schools and our students? I know locally we spend a lot of time and effort on securing our campuses as well as working with our staffs on security procedures and safety procedures. Maybe from the state perspective, what else yes. is being done? Well, thank you for uh, bringing that up. And uh, I was in Los Angeles, the, the Board of Education invited me to come down uh, during the afternoon. I took part with the, the board and the mayor of Los Angeles and the uh, police chief for the school police uh, took part in the, the press conference they had explaining what had happened. Uh, I sat down with the, the chief, by the way, uh, and one of the school board members happened to be working late at night and this email popped up and it was uh, very threatening. Uh, and, you know, it said we have bombs and we have guns and we're going to go after multiple sites. We have 32 jihadists who are there and we're ready to go tomorrow. And they had to, is this a hoax? Is this real? Is this a hoax? Is this real? Uh, but we, then they put themselves in the, the position of parents. If you knew the district had this threat, and wasn't, they weren't sure if it was a credible threat or not, would you send your child to school if you knew there was that threat? And the answer was almost unanimous. Most parents would not want to put their children in any threat of harm's way whatsoever. So this is a tricky new area because the, 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 these incidences are horrible, tragic, uh, uh, just crazy in terms of the havoc and then what it does to all the survivors, the students, teachers, the, you know, the family members who've lost, lost loved ones. So it's a very, very tough situation. One of the things that I did after San Bernardino, I talked to my friend James Ramos, who's the chairman of the Board of Supervisors there, I talked to a friend who had a business near where the shootings were in San Bernardino. And I said, you know, we, we have the law that says you have to have school safety plans, you have to update them so often, uh, but how well are we prepared? How well are we trained? And what can we learn from what's happened in, from Sandy Hook up to these more recent instances? So I think we can always improve. And I did call in the press conference in Los Angeles. Uh, I did call for an, up, an upgrade, a relook at all of our uh, school safety plans. And to have uh, law enforcement is, generally speaking, very coordinated. So in San Bernardino, for instance, you know, the city police, school police, sheriff, CHP, FBI, all worked together and they did they've done trainings together so they know where to go and how to support each other and how to set up command centers and and have you know single lines of authority generally speaking but uh, an area that may not be as strong as having law enforcement walk through our school campuses with 
uh, the parent coordinator for the school safety, school board member, the, the people in your staff who are responsible, just to give law enforcement a feel, the topography of your campus, the layout of your campus. Uh, so what we're going to do is collect best practices on, we're going to look, I put out a letter, did you, did you get my letter yet, Mary? Thank you. Uh, so we're saying that schools are doing a great job right now. Our schools are doing a great job of providing for safety, but let's learn from these instances and can we make it even stronger. And so we'll take the best practices and we have a conference in July uh, where there'll be panels and presenters taking the best of the best approaches, sharing experiences so that we can learn from them and be better prepared. I really appreciate that because I know when, when that happened, particularly that same day when it, uh, the same message went to New York and they took a different tack than LA did, I, I think it left all of us with that question about, okay, what would I do if I was in that situation? And, and dealing with that on local as well as that state level is very important. And could you think if you were a parent and found out later that the school district had hidden from you the fact that there was a threat, and would, how would you feel? So trust would be broken, and there'd be a lot of other consequences. Exactly. Um, just one quick question back on Common Core. Uh, what can parents do to prepare for Common Core? That's the question we seem to get quite a bit. You know, as uh, we're trying to provide the best possible professional development for our staffs, uh, our staffs then working with the kids, but then the kids come home with homework that's a little different, or, you know, different grades than they were used to. Um, any, any thoughts about that? It's not easy, and, and uh, again, it's a big shift for the faculties, for the teachers, and for the students in the day-to-day -day classroom. Now, in communities like San Juan Valley, almost everyone's connected to the internet. Uh, in other parts of California, only 70% you know, are connected to the internet. Um, and so what about the other 30%? Those who are connected to the internet, there are great uh, lesson plans. You can, as a parent, see how it works. Uh, look at modules that uh, go through some of the math. So, so math, particularly, I think, is puzzling a lot of parents. But other, other parts of it are more like common sense. For instance, uh, the Common Core and the new standards say, don't think in a silo. Math is not just a math by itself, or science isn't just science by itself. And civics and social studies, they're not all detached, it's all connected. So some of that, I think, is more intuitive, and parents will, will see, oh, that makes sense. For instance, global warming, fact, fiction, uh, you can do math, you can look at carbon graph lines in the atmosphere, you can look at carbon, the acidification of the ocean with carbon uh, coming from the atmosphere, combining with water to form carbon dioxide, uh, is threatening all the crustaceans, all the mollusks, all the shelled animals, the coral reefs. So, and then the question is, you can do math, you can do science, you can do that. And then uh, the civics of it is, well, is this uh, geologic cycles or is this man-made? Is this human-caused? And the debate is rich, and students really have to think, and they have to research, and they have to get evidence for their point of view. And so I think parents can see some of those in science and social studies more clearly how it works. But English language, arts, and math, um, we need to provide some more help, and especially for the people who don't have internet connection. Some schools offer workshops on the weekend so parents can get an orientation. Be sure to go to back to school nights, and be sure to go to open house and take advantage of the school's open doors because they want to help. It, it sounds like another one of those areas where, you know, looking for best practices because we're all going through this and really all trying to determine how best we can create a situation where everyone can feel comfortable with these changing the standards so that we all make sure that we're being as best, we can do the best we can for our students. It's not like flipping a light switch. It's going to take some time. Any, any sense how long it's going to take? I think within three to four years, we should be, you know, with this year, you know, behind us three or four years going forward, we should be, you know, humming along at a more optimal level um, with less bumps and more uniformity and uh, approaching and, and more comfort level in, in delivering this new style of teaching. Just one last question. This, you mentioned the use of technology and appropriate technology. I just wonder if you can say a few more words about how you see that transition going, particularly with instructional materials. That's been another issue for folks as, you know, we've put, we started to implement Common Core in the classroom, but not all the materials have been available. And it seems like we're, we're in the middle of this transition from textbooks, technology, Maybe you can say a few words about that. Well, I would say first, stop mowing down trees. 
uh, go digital. And you know, it's, it's, I've been working on this for 10 years when I was in the legislature. Uh, it's a gradual uh, transformation. Yes, there'll be hardbound books, but uh, the beauty of digital is you can update science, you can update history, you can update civics and social studies. Um, you know, in many of our classrooms, the textbooks, you know, Pluto was still a dog in the Disney, uh, you know, cartoons and maybe a planet somewhere and other kind of places, you know, it's not, Obama's not even president, Afghanistan hasn't occurred, uh, but digitally you can update. So to me, it's going to be more efficient in the long run and our students will get better information. And then the learning programs they have are just ingenious and creative and fun. You know how kids like to work with games on computers, um, some of those entertainment games that may not have a lot of value, but if you make a math lesson or a math program or a science program uh, fun like a game, you also, you're sort of assessing the student and the student's learning concepts. So ST Math is one ingenious program, Imagine Learning for English learners. So these softwares and these uh, websites you can go to to enrich the classroom instruction are very valuable and again, I think a game changer. Yeah, we're, we're finding, particularly in our special needs classrooms, use of technology has just been critical for our users. Yeah. Tom, thank you so thank much. You, thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Teamwork. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Lee back up to the podium for some presentations. Thank you, Kim, and uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, before I talk next, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce another elected official, uh, Jamie Hinsky, President of the Unified School District. Jamie, are you still here? Thank you for coming. And uh, I think it, uh, the superintendent they did give us a very uh, informational uh, speech, and we thank him again, give him a lot, another round of applause. <laughs> and uh, for this event, we got uh, several sponsors. Uh, I'd like to recognize them. Uh, they are um, Okay, uh, they are the CC in, uh, Inns McDonald and, oh, and also Inns Educational Foundation and the Sandy Chow from uh, Vision New America and uh, Yama Jimil from Bank of West and uh, Masha Glanko from Glanko uh, Global and uh, Linda Chen from uh, Summer Valley Chinese School uh, Linda and uh, David Gao uh, from the High Valley Financial Planning Service. Is David here? Uh, Linda, I see Linda here. David couldn't make it. And uh, Lily Zhu, Financial Strategist. Is Lily here? Uh, Lily is on the back. And uh, Jin Zhu uh, of Ceremon Realtor. Uh, she's out of country. Also, Dr. Aimin Liu the, from uh, Smile Solutions. And um, they each donated $250 uh, to the event. Uh, thank you all very much. And uh, our uh, Papa Traveling uh, Board member uh, unanimously voted to give all the money to we received for this event to the Cerebral Valley uh, Unif uh, Education Foundation. So next, uh, I'd like to uh, have uh, the chair, uh, Colin Zing, to come to the stage and uh, to accept the check from the superintendent, Tom Tolakson. is also my classmate at Ceremon Valley Leadership Program. is not an exception. For all the volunteers today, thank you all very much. Uh, also, I'd like to thank you, uh, our co-host, Ceremon Valley Unified School District, and the uh, organizer, Douglas Xia, for this event. 
and all the theater staff. Uh, let's uh, give them a round of applause. Uh, it has been a year and a half since a Papa Travali chapter started, and in the past, we have many volunteers. Uh, for this event, um, I mean, thank them all very much. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to especially thank one volunteer. She put a tremendous amount of time into a papa. I still remember that she talked with me at about like 2.30 a.m. to discuss some detail of our grand opening. And uh, from educational forum, town hall meetings, to voter registration, our grand opening, and uh, membership drive. She's one of the key players for almost all of our events, and she did tons of work. She also chaired some educational forum for the youth, organized the volunteer for families of children with special need, and also volunteers for a rental education fundraising event in Saramon. So next, I'd like to invite uh, Papa Traveling Chapter Vice President, Vice President Treasurer Nancy Chen, come to the stage. For all her hard work, she is awarded 2015 a Papa Berry Region Outstanding Volunteer of the Year. So let's welcome the State Superintendent Tom Glasser again to present this award to Nancy. Okay, thank you. And again, thank you everyone for coming to tonight. And I think we have a wonderful event. And uh, again, thank you, the time direction. I think uh, that's uh, the end of the event.